We're going? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, this is our first one of these. At least our first one uh, doing it together. Uh, I'm Danny. That's Danny. I'm Chris. Um, we have a comic book. Not, not sure if you guys are aware of that. It's called L.A. Crazy Town. You should look into it if you don't know about it. It's pretty awesome. It's really fucking great. Um, this guy writes it. I kind of write it, too. He co-writes it. Yeah. You wrote the second chapter when D goes in cases. and Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. And you, I've written a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So have you. Uh, I only wrote three. Now we both wrote the first one. Anyway. Yeah. You wrote some of uh, Calavetas, and I wrote some Calavetas. Yeah. Well, I, that's actually next. Yeah. Yeah. The next chapter. After, yeah, after Gato is a Calavetas story. I actually wrote one uh, full script of it, but that kind of got, nah, we're not going to do that one. And then we moved on to another one, and they're like, eh. And then that got fixed into what we currently have. So, but I did help with that one. So, anywho. Um, ugh. This, even though we're mentioning the comic right now, it's because we, we what we do. That's what we do. This is this is our life, yeah. our livelihood. But that's not what this is about. This video. No. We wanted to just talk a little bit about um, something that we just saw, which was <laughs> it was really something. <laughs> yeah, it was really something. It was something. Um, we just watched a movie. From 1984, I'd never seen it before. Uh, Danny, Danny has seen it yeah, at least it a few is, times. Right? Yeah, it is like my my favorite movie. Yeah, so he my knew it. Movie. He knew it well yeah. beforehand. And it's uh, called uh, Streets of Fire. Streets of Fire. Um, Streets of Fire. 1984 stars uh, Michael Pare, uh, Diane Lane, Rick Moranis, um, Amy Madigan. Uh, I'm going to see if I can remember everybody. Uh, Willem Dafoe. I don't know Willem why Dafoe. the fuck I didn't think of that yeah. first. Um, young Willem Dafoe. Uh, young Willem Dafoe. Well, it's 84, so yeah. yeah. Young everybody. Um, there's there's a lot of... Uh, Bill Paxton has a few scenes. Uh, oh, God. Ed Bigley Jr., I was telling him before when I noticed him in the movie. He's in, like, one scene, but he's in it. Um, and a bunch of other guys that, you know, you'll see in the movie and you'll be like, oh, I've seen that guy before. Yeah. So, what is Streets of Fire, Danny? It is a rock and roll fable. Yeah. And uh, it is amazing. It's, yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, for me, I mean, I love, I love that movie. It's, <laughs> it's so cheesy now when you look at it, but uh, I don't know. It's just the atmosphere of it, the, the fucking... Well, okay, yeah, let, let's hear about that. What's um setting? What's the setting? The setting is in another time, another place. That's, that's literally what it says on the screen literally, when you first start watching the movies. Yeah, another it's, time, uh, another place. But more specifically, it's yeah. uh, nineteen. It's like it's a time stuck in the 1950s. But, but it's in the future. But it's kind of in the future, yeah. Yeah. But everyone... Did, didn't they, they think mention it? that it's in the future? But everything is stuck in yeah. the 50s. Yeah. It's, like, they don't mention that in a movie. I mean, you see it all in the synopsis and whatnot. Yeah. That's what they get from it, I'm assuming. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah... Right in the 1950s. Think of it kind of like a Batman. You know those old Batman ones with uh, damn, what was what was his name? You you liked it. You liked those. Keaton. Movies. Keaton. Michael, Michael Keaton. Keaton. Yeah, Michael Keaton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. That's a really good way to look at it because the cars in that were all kind of like yeah, they were very retro. They were all like way older. Yeah. Or even like to go along with Batman, the Batman animated series, where it's like the technology is. It's really ahead of time, but then everybody drives cars that are like from the 30s, and the guns are like old timey pistols and yeah, shit like that. Yeah. And it was just kind of like, why? Yeah. They fly around in blimps, and it was like, haven't we learned by now? Blimps, they're not good. <laughs> they, they don't, no, don't do that. It's full of helium. Yeah. Non flammable helium. Yeah. Um, but, back to the movie. Okay. Right. So, it's, it says it's a, a, a rock and roll fable that's like, I guess that's part of the title. Streets of Streets of Fire, a rock and roll fable. Yeah. It's kind of like the the subtitle. That's its tagline. Yeah, the tagline. Um, so, what is it? Well, um, as we said, it's 
set in the future, possibly, but everybody is has a 1950s uh, mentality. All of the music is it's not 50s music. Oh. It's movie. Th- it, it's music that's from like the 80s. Yeah, but it's done in a 50s fashion, yeah. kind of. It's, a... um, it, it's I mean, it's done really well. All yeah, of the music in it is great. Yeah, everyone looks like they came straight out of the eighties in that thing. Yeah, all of the outfits are yeah. definitely from the eighties. Like but, um, you got you got uh, you got Tom Cody. Oh, that's Michael Pare. He's yeah, playing Tom Cody. Yeah, Michael, Michael Pare. Uh, yeah, he's a hero of the story. Yeah, and he he's on a mission. Yes, he has a mission. Um. Early in the film, you we see uh, Diane Lane. She's playing uh, Ellen Aim, Aim like A I M. Um, she's a big rock and roll star. She's doing a concert, and um, her manager slash boyfriend is Rick Moranis, known as Fish, <laughs> Phil Fish. Yeah, Rick Moranis. Though, wrap your heads around that one, yeah. guys. It's Dark Helmet is her boyfriend. <laughs> um, yeah, he's very, very different than this one. Yeah, he's. Like, I know his like his like he had he had this whole comedy show before. He's had a lot of comedy shows. Yeah, I mean no, oh, I mean, like before his family friendly like, friendly uh, time. Like, yeah, he was um, SCTV and um, Saturday Night Live. Yeah, so he was on Saturday people Night from Live. my generation didn't. Really you see you that. wouldn't know that, but. Yeah. Yeah, people from my generation might. Not everybody watched SCTV when I was a kid, but um, that was like Canada's version of Saturday Night Live. Mm. Not quite as funny, but still okay. Anyways, he's playing her manager slash boyfriend. He's booked her a gig. She's doing the songs. Uh, She's up on stage, and um, she finishes... She and her band, they finish the first song... While they're uh, wrapping it up, Willem Dafoe, evil young Willem Dafoe, <laughs> comes in with a gang of guys, and the they're bombers. yeah, they're they're a biker gang, and they're called the Bombers, and everybody wears um, the leather suits, the leather nineteen fifties. Yeah, think Marlon Brando nineteen fifties. That is literally what they wear. The, yeah. the leather black cap, black uh, leather jackets, leather yeah. leather everything. Yeah. Everything is leather. In fact, one of the outfits that he wears later is really leather and really just stupid. <laughs> um, yeah, that little number. Yeah. Anyways, so uh, they're, she's wrapping up the song. These guys have come into the crowd, and apparently police... They kind of just have their on and off days. Um, there's literally no security for this. The biggest rock star in all of the world, apparently. There's no security whatsoever. There's no cops. There's no nothing. This gang just rushes the... the um, Think of it like Double the Dragon when they just take take the girlfriend. Yeah, they, they, they do that. They, they rush the stage and they just take her. That's it. They beat the shit out of her band and, you know, any other guys that jump on the stage are like, hey, you shouldn't do... I think one of the guys actually says, you shouldn't be doing that. And then he gets punched in the face so hard that the audience feels it. (laughs) I mean, that just looked terrible. Yeah. Um, So they've kidnapped her. Yeah. Now, we could go into what happens in every fucking scene, but there's really no point in that. Why did he kidnap her? Because she was pretty. That was. You might think that he's dumbing it down. No, that's literally the explanation. Willem Dafoe. He he has her chained up or cuffed up into a bed, and she's laying there. And he honestly just says to her something like, "You know, I I I love looking at pretty girls. Um, I want you to be my girlfriend for about a week or two. And, and then just, after that, I'll just let you go, and you won't be hurt at all. Yeah. That's it. That's the whole fucking thing. 
that was the plot. No ransom, no crazy psychotic, uh, I'm your biggest fan, so now I'm going to kill you like uh, Selena or anything like that. No, it's just you're going to be my girlfriend for the next two weeks, and when I'm done, you can go. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to do anything to you. Shut up, Tara. Um, that's it. That's his motivation. I don't know whether or not that is <laughs> the stupidest motivation or the most brilliant motivation. But it is one or the other. Because that really just... That just... That's it. It's like, no, I'm not really thinking this plan through. It's just, I want her. I'm going to fuck her for the next two weeks. And then when I'm done, you know, I'm not going to beat up on you. You can just leave. That's it. Nobody's going to hurt you. And aside from the part where they, you know, hit her in the stomach and well, threw yeah. them over the shoulder. Yeah, to, <laughs> to, to get her. They've really copied Double Dragon with that shit. Yeah. Or maybe this came out before Double no, I'm Dragon. I'm pretty sure it came out before. Oh, so Double Dragon copied this. Might have. Mm, they um, have a big influence in Japan, I heard. Okay, well, uh, yeah, they, they just, when they got her on the stage, they, like, punched her in the gut. And yeah, actually, it reminds me of a final fight where some gangs take... The guy, the main guy from Final Fight is uh, Cody, Cody. Tra Cody Travers. Yeah. Cody. His name is Cody Travers. Yeah. <laughs> well, and this, the main good guy is Tom Cody. Yeah. But they're still Cody. Yeah. So, I don't know, is this all the same uh, universe? Uh, they take, know. yeah, they take, uh, the Mad Gear gang takes, uh, takes his girlfriend and he goes around single-handedly punching everybody in the, the city. Mad, Mad Gear gang. Mad Gear gang. Good name. Good name. Okay, so okay, so we've gotten up to the point where um, young Willem Dafoe, evil, crazy Willem Dafoe, has captured Diane Lane. She's handcuffed to a uh, to a bed. There's really no reason for it, but they were just it, it's Friday night. We got to do something. Fuck it, let's kidnap the most famous pop singer in the world. Why not? You know what else do you do out here? Um, so now somebody has to go rescue her. Who's it going to be? Yeah. Well, it's going to be Michael Pare. Now in the 80s, Michael Pare did a lot of uh, movies. He did a good number of movies. And he was kind of on his way to being a pretty good, you know, action, get in there, kick the shit out of the bad guy star. Um, I don't know. I didn't do that much after the 90s, I think. So I don't know. Maybe he just didn't want to act anymore. Whatever. But, yes, like we said, he's Tom Cody, and he's there, and he takes no prisoners, and, um, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, the story is, the, the backstory to this is that he used to date uh, Ellen Aim. They were boyfriend and girlfriend, and yeah. broke up. Yeah, and he, he went out uh, to the military yeah, he joined for the about army. two years. Yeah. And he came back uh, as, uh, uh, as they say, a soldier of fortune. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. I mean, soldier of fortune really implies mercenary, which is like somebody who gets in there and actually does like dirty If anything, work. McCoy was more of a soldier of fortune. Well, we haven't gotten to explaining who McCoy is yet, no, but we will. Um, okay, so... Shut up, Tom. So, Tom Cody is going to... He... He gets asked by his sister. She was in the concert, and she's like, "Oh, this sucks. My favorite singer is kidnapped." So she tells him, well, "You got to rescue." Exactly her. her reasoning. No, but you know, she she tells him, "You got to rescue her. She's your ex girlfriend. You know you love her, and she was the best thing." Yes, I know. She was the best thing that ever happened to you. Just trying to put some closure on that. Yeah, something like that. I guess something like that. So, uh, sister. Talks him into it. Uh, the sister, I can't remember what her name is. I know the character was named Reva. Never heard that name before. R-E-V-A. Whatever. But I know that she was the girl that was in the movie The Warriors. That was hanging out with the guys. And um, going with them to like all the places when they were getting their asses kicked by all these other gangs. Did you ever see The Warriors? Yeah, I did. Yeah. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> she was the girl. That was her. She was the girl that was like, oh, you warriors think you're so tough and all this shit like that. And Yeah, she really reminds me of Michelle Rodriguez. Like, she like, kind of Face-wise. Yeah. She looks a lot like her. Yeah, kind of. Or rather, Michelle Rodriguez looks a lot like her. Yeah. Yeah. 
way off topic. Um, anyways, so, yeah, she, he goes and he talks to her uh, manager, who is her boyfriend, who is Rick Moranis, who is Phil Fish. Phil Fish. And he tells him, okay, I'm going to go rescue her, but it's going to cost you $10,000. Okay. Yeah. So. To prove that it's all for the money. Or I guess. Something. I don't know. But uh, he finally talks him into it. He uh, has met this chick at a bar played by Amy Madigan. And her character's name is McCoy. Yeah. That's it. Just McCoy. Just McCoy. I'm and, assuming it's a last name, but yeah. that's all she goes by ever. In the, in the credits at the end, it's just Amy Madigan McCoy. All right, fine. That's all she needs. And she is about as butch as butch can be. Um, she has this whole scene with him, with uh, Michael Pare, where it's just one liner after the other, trying to prove who has the bigger balls. <laughs> and she probably has bigger balls than him, because she really does not, like... She, she's just one tough, angry bitch in this. Um, I'm sure Amy Madigan is a very nice person in real life, but in this, she's just really... Wow. You know, you you, you want to yell something like bull, Butch Bull Dyke kind of thing, but that might be saying a little too much, going a little far. But it's in the back of your mind. She's really just... She has a penis. Okay. She does. I'm going to cut that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to cut that. I'm talking about the character. I'm not talking about Amy Madigan. Anyways... Uh, yeah, so, oh, and he tells her, okay, you can come with me and help me rescue my ex-girlfriend. You'll get a thousand bucks out of it, and there we go. So, we get two people up against the entire world to rescue his former love. This is very, almost Shakespearean. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they need Phil Fish to go with them because he knows the area where the bombers biker gang, they hang out, and apparently Tom Cody doesn't know anything about that area, so he's like, no, you got to drive us around and tell her, or you got to point out where all this shit is and all that. Yeah. So, so you already know that he's, uh, like, not all he seems to be as well. Like, Phil. Phil Fish? Yeah. Hmm. So he's, uh... Yeah, you can see that he, he comes from, he has humble beginnings. Yeah. Because in the whole movie, his whole... Like, his character is just, like, driven around, I'm the greatest thing in the world, I have all the money. Yeah. Um, Very high and mighty kind of guy. Yeah. Coming from Rick Moranis, who is three foot tall. And they do a lot to show that. <laughs> yeah. 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 They do a lot to show that he has this um, Napoleon Yeah, he's got the, he's got, he definitely got that chip on his shoulder. Yeah. Um, okay, so, where are we? They, the, the, the whole, the whole little, gang, the is whole together. kidnapping thing, where they go out and grab her, mm -hmm. that that's pretty resolved like halfway through the movie. Yeah, no, I think it was even before. Well, maybe. Yeah, it's, I don't know. It's, it's it wasn't a very long movie. Surprisingly short. Yeah, it's about an hour. That's about it. Yeah, surprisingly short. But yeah, you're right. It was they they go and they just like get past the bombers. I will explain how they do that in a second. But they get past the bombers and they, they rescue Diane Lane. They have her saved yeah. by, like, the halfway part in the movie. And it's like, oh, well, that was resolve, resolved really quickly. Yeah. Okay, what are they going to do now? When they get there to rescue her, though, they, they kind of both have, like, McCoy and Cody have two different mindsets. Cody uh, McCoy goes in, she infiltrates this bar where all the bombers are, and she's like, oh, this one guy is, like, hitting on her, and she, yeah. she like, takes him to a back room, she pulls out a, a, a forty-five, and she just smacks him in the head and knocks him out. And then she just, she comes in, and she busts up uh, this poker game that had Willem Dafoe playing Raven, that's his name, Raven, and some of his boys, they're all playing poker, and she's just holding the gun on them. Meanwhile... Cody is outside with a cowboy repeater yeah. on top of a building, and he's shooting at the um, at the bombers. He's shooting at them while they're on their motorcycles, <laughs> and he's 
he's making sure to hit every motorcycle in the gas tank, causing everybody riding to their motorcycles to explode into a fiery death. <laughs> yeah. She took a far more passive route where it's just she had to shoot somebody, but he did rush her. But that's just because he was a fucking idiot and he just rushed her when she has a gun pointing at him. But she knocked the dude out and then she held Willem Dafoe at gunpoint. She didn't shoot him. Cody is killing everything. <laughs> He's blowing up everything that he can. And it was just like, dude, you've got a lot of pent-up anger. <laughs> you haven't blown something up in a long time, have you? You've been needing that, haven't yeah, you? He, he you did know? mention he liked firing guns. Yeah, he did say that. So after uh, they, after all the explosions and all the fiery death, what happens? Uh, let's see. Yeah. Oh, they rescue her. Yeah, they rescue her, they get the car, they gotta ditch the car. Yeah, they gotta ditch the car. That for him but that's actually kinda of smart thinking on his point. Yeah. Like, you know, they see his car and they'll be like, Oh, well, now we know who he is. Yeah. So Not only that though, he does actually tell Willem Dafoe his exact fucking name. He says, yeah. um, he says uh, My name's Cody, Tom Cody. And he's like, I'm be coming for you. Like, why did you fuck? Just tell him your name is like Bill Everett or some shit like that. What the fuck does it matter? Because you could have moved that town to burn. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 1984, I loved you. Yeah, exactly. It's like, uh, there, there was no reason for him to come back at all after no. all that. It's like, there was no guarantee that Diane was going to be there. Right. Was, like, even Rick Moranis was like, yeah, we're getting out of here first plus, you know, out of here. Yeah. But then, yeah, so it's... But... You know, movies. You got to... Movies, yeah. Gotta... Movies. Um, okay, so they, they... They've rescued her. They've switched cars. They hook up with some little chick who's... Um, yeah, she's a groupie. She's a groupie. And I'm not saying little like she's like 12 or something. I'm saying little like she's probably 18, but she looks like she's 12. I mean, she was like two feet tall. She was tiny as hell. Um, they have to... Hijack a bus, which has a band called the Sorrells on it, and they're four dudes, four black dudes, who are trying to make it as a band, but apparently, I guess they, I don't know, didn't, at some point in the movie, they are like, saying that it's, like, it's harder for black uh, groups to get music, uh, to get it was, it was, it was subtle. It was, yeah, it, it was, was really subtle. Yeah, they're yeah. like, they're, there's definitely some racism going on. Yeah, but it was, it wasn't like in your face, like, hi, welcome to Alabama. Yeah, get in the tree. It wasn't that kind of shit. Yeah. It was just, you know, it was there, but it was kind of like, eh, yeah, it had some, it had some subtle tones in there. Yeah, it's like, yeah, this place was like, I mean, where they were was already a dump, but you know, where they <laughs> went to was more of a dump. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, there wasn't any pretty places in any yeah. of the city. Everything looked like shit. Really. Yeah. Uh, even the good part of the town, that looked like shit. Yeah. Um, they they hook up with the Sorrells. They do their little audition yeah. for Ellen because they recognize her as she's the biggest fucking pop star in the world. It's like, you know, if you've got Madonna or Michael Jackson or something like that sitting on the bus right next to you, yeah. you're going to know who it is. Um, but, yeah, they're like, you know, oh, they're singing to her, and they're really good. And... Um, I don't know, they get, there's a police blockade that they got to get through, which Michael Parry, Tom Cody, he has to blow everything up. Well, I think, wait, was it McCoy or Cody that blew everything up? Uh, well, McCoy just put them all down and, like, took their guns away and whatnot. Oh, and then he blew everything up? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> then he blew everything up. Why not? It's a police blockade, and, you know, it was, did you fucking blow up all their shit? Why not? Um... So, you know, at that point, then it would be like, you know, now I've got a whole gang of bikers, and now all the cops that want Except me. that never happened. Except that never <laughs> happened, yeah. The cops, never, they, no, they were just like, yeah, try to find them. That, you know, and that and those whatever. were the asshole cops that everyone knew were assholes. Yeah, they were like, yeah, they were it, you, you got, slightly you got racist, that. and also they were like on yeah. the take. You definitely got that feeling from them. Well, obviously, I mean, they were like, they were taking bribes. Yeah. One. 
And, uh, Although that was really funny. They get pulled over. They they hit the they hit the um the roadblock. The roadblock. Two two of the cops come on, and like immediately, uh, Rick Moranis, Phil Fish jumps in. He's like, "All right, all right, all right. I know how this shit goes. Uh, what's it gonna cost for us to get past here?" And like, he hands him some money, and then the cops like, "Nah, give us some more." So he's like, all right, "Whatever." Banter, banter, banter. He gives him the money, and then it would be like, "All right, just go." Yeah. But then the cop points out there. He's like, "You know, you were really quick to give me this money." Yeah. And it was like. Wait, really? <laughs> That's what you're going to fuck with him yeah. for? Because he's just ready to give you the money? It's like, because it was like, usually, I guess he would be used to like, like saying, yeah, you give us like a hundred bucks and we'll look the other way. And somebody's going to try to talk him down or like, you know, whatever, but then eventually get talked into it. Whereas Moranis was just like, nah, here's the money. Let's go. And now he's got a problem with this. Uh, that to me just seemed kind of silly. I would think that the cop would have been like appreciative if anything. He'd be like, "Good, you made this go fast. Yeah. Nice. Oh, I got you know, got to get home to the yeah. wife and kids." But again, movie, movie, <laughs> movie. Yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> they that. had, they have to have something go on. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say that just when it's like went. anytime you think there's a lull in the action, it it something, just wakes you up. After yeah, that. something has to happen. Something, something kind of happens. Yeah, um, we can kind of skip to the end, but there is one part where I definitely want to. No. Mention, and I think you already know what I'm going to talk about really quickly. Um, the chief, the the chief of police, um, tells him tells Cody, you got to leave. So you know, get out of town. Don't come back. Uh, if I see that guy Raven, I'm locking him up. We're going to throw him away or throw away the key. You know, and all this shit. And then, which is really stupid because I was trying to point out to Danny, you could lock him up anyways. He did commit a felony. Yeah. Kidnapping is kind of a felony. It's a fairly big thing. But apparently he has to show up for them to arrest him. <laughs> I don't know. I guess those are the rules. Movie. But he gets onto a train with, um, with Diane Lane and Amy Madigan, and now he and Diane have kind of fixed everything up between them. Because he was supposed to take the money, and he didn't take the money. But he get, he took the money. He he promised McCoy a thousand bucks, so he took a thousand dollars out of the ten thousand that he was supposed to get. He only took the thousand, and he gave that to McCoy. So she was, yeah, even yeah. Stevens. But he didn't take any of the money. The rest of nine grand, he didn't take any of that shit for him. So, in Diane Lane's mind, in her character Ellen Ames' mind. He loves me. So, she fucked him. Because why not? Even though she's dating Rick Moranis. Although, physically with the two, Michael Paré, Rick Moranis. I'm sorry, Rick. I'm kind of leaning towards Michael Paré being more manly subject. Kind of. So, anyways. Yeah, they're boned. And, uh... They're on a train, and they're leaving, and they pull up to a station. The, like, the train comes to a stop. What does he do, Danny? <laughs> you tell it. Uh, he, he uh, I, I, what did I tell you before that whole scene started? I'm like, oh, yeah, it's over. You know, like, that's it. You know, it's over. And you're like, yeah. Right. right. And then right as I said it, he decks her right across the face. Yeah, he punches <laughs> the shit out of Diane and Lane. And he punches her so hard, it hurt me. I mean, wow. The whole point of it was that he was going to go back to fight um, Willem Dafoe, Raven. Yeah. But he could have just told her, look, i got to do this. It's a man thing or whatever. Yeah, she's going to say, no, I don't want you to go. No, which we should just leave. Yeah, which wouldn't be out of place because there was... No, that would be very (laughs) intelligent on her part. And actually, it would have been smarter on his part just to shut the fuck up and go. But, rather than listen to her try to talk him out of it, punch! Yeah. Just not. I did not see that shit coming. (laughs) I did not see that coming at all. I laughed when I saw that, because, I mean, that's horrible. That was a really good punch. Uh, That's a punch that'll knock out a pretty good-sized dude. And he did that to fucking Diane Lane. That's just wrong. You don't do that to Diane Lane, man. No, you don't do that to her, ever. 
She's way too pretty. Don't do that to her. God damn. <laughs> she was going to be missing teeth after that. I mean, that was a punch, dude. Anyways, after he's punched the shit out of his girlfriend. Ex-girlfriend. Or, yeah. Fuck, buddy. That was weird. Whatever. Uh, it's, it's a comfort and uh, it's comfort versus support sort of thing. Whatever it is. I don't know. After he's punched the shit out of her, <laughs> um, yeah, he goes back and uh, there's going to be a showdown. And Raven shows up with like four bajillion of his biker guys and everybody got a rifle or a shotgun or something. And there's like four cops. And they're looking at the cops as the funniest shit ever. Yeah. Um, the cops' plan was that... Uh, uh, Tom Cody is going to leave town, and when Raven shows up, he's just going to arrest his ass because Raven promised he's only going to show up with two of his guys, and that was it. And you know, if yeah. there's anybody that you can trust, it's Willem Dafoe. <laughs> just look at him; he's totally trustworthy. Yeah, it's not like that haircut that they gave him. That no, day. that didn't that didn't even make it worse. It looked like a cobra. It kind of did. Yeah, it, it was did. like it was a 1950s greaser style yeah. pompadour, but. It looks angular like, yeah, and it, it just looks like a cobra head, like right here. And it's like if Dracula nice. got a fucking pompadour. Exactly. It was just like, dude, you are just I evil. I am a bad guy. You are evil <laughs> even in your hair. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was the chief's plan. Was yeah, we're gonna just arrest him, and that's <laughs> it. So he shows up. Uh, Raven shows up, and there's no Cody there. So. Cops like, no, nope, get off your bike. Uh, we're we're gonna do this. I'm gonna arrest you and whatever. Blah blah blah. So he pulls out a bullhorn and summons a lot. Of summons guys. all his guys and there's forty billion of them. Like I said, there's all of the, all of the bombers. Everybody's got a gun or two or four. I don't know. Everybody's packing. And then Con uh, Tom Cody shows up to save the day. But then he goes up to the cop, and the cop says the funniest shit. What did he say? He was like, he walked up to him, and he said, well, my plan went to shit. Let's see what you got. It was <laughs> just like, yep, yeah. that's exactly what happened. Your plan did go to shit. Now we got to leave it to the other guy. And then we have one of the strangest one-on-one uh, -on -one fights I've ever seen, mm -hmm. but probably one of the best I've ever seen. Why? They fight with sledgehammers. They fight each other with <laughs> sledgehammers. Why did they fight each other with sledgehammers? Fuck you. Movie. It's, it's a, a movie. It's a movie. They had sledgehammers. It was cool. Yeah, they had sledgehammers. They weren't like the big heavy mallet. No, these ones. were like rail spikes. Yeah, they were like, yeah, that's exactly what it was. They were like the ones that you use for like uh, slamming in rails, uh, railroad spikes on the tracks and shit like that. So it was like they were more angular. So yeah. if you actually hit somebody with them, not only is it going to fucking bash all their bones, but it's going to cut them, too. Yeah. It's like, dude, wow, yeah. medievals, all right? <laughs> what is this shit? What is this medieval shit? Um, yeah, so they're they're fighting and fighting and fighting, and fucking Willem Dafoe hits him in the back with this thing. And honestly, I gotta say, that should have been the fight. That really should have been it, because he hit him in the back with a fucking sledgehammer. Uh... No, you're not getting up. No. I mean, he just kind of brushed it off. Yeah. Michael Pare is like, apparently he's like Thor or something like that. He's just like, whatever. Immune I'll keep to, going. Immune to sledgehammers. Yeah, immune to sledgehammers. But uh, yeah, he just fucking, he just kept on going and they're fighting. And then um, he disarmed him. He disarmed Willem yeah. Dafoe. And then he's got a chance to just, like, fucking baseball bat swing him. Yeah. But does he do it? No, he's the hero. Even though he's blown people the fuck up. <laughs> I don't know how many people he they shot. They were non-lethal explosions. They, yeah. No, what he, it was is that there were people that didn't matter because they didn't have names. <laughs> well, he explicitly <laughs> stated, like, at the beginning, he's like, he's not there to kill anybody. But how you don't kill somebody with an explosion. Yeah, that's yeah, that's pretty hard. That's 80s hero magic. Yeah. No, yeah, no, explosions kill people. That's pretty much just how they work. But, uh, yeah, so rather than just, you know, crack this guy's skull open, he's like, hey, whatever, tosses the sledgehammer away. So that just, like, then Willem Dafoe, he turned into the Green Goblin right there. I even said it when we were watching it. <laughs> he went in full Goblin mode because he made the face and everything. And even back then, this is 84, so that's what, 60, that's 30 years ago. 
he looked exactly the same. And when you see him do like the Green Goblin, like yeah, the, ah, yeah. that face in the movies, that's the face he made in this. Yeah. And it was just like, I, I might have given up just because of that face, because that was horrifying. Mm-hmm. But then it's like, now we're going into fist fighting. And they're fist fighting and rolling all over the place, and Mike, uh, uh, Willem Dafoe basically throws Michael Parry into every one of his guys' motorcycles and just <laughs> knocks everything the fuck over. I mean, he's just like yeah, he's going throwing him around yeah, and shit. Like beast mode. Yeah, he was, yeah, he was full-on beast mode. And then... Michael Parry won. Of course. Because he's the good guy. Yeah. So. Did the cool guy thing where he tips the bad guy over? Yeah. <laughs> that was ridiculous. Mm. I mean, that was just like, what? I did not see that shit coming, to be yeah. honest. He's, Willem Dafoe was just standing there, and he's just like, <sighs> and he's like, he looks like he just ran a marathon, and he's still got his arms up, and then Michael Parry just walks up to him, and he's and he just, and, and it was like, really? It was played completely straight. Yeah. It was like, yeah, this is not a 1984, like, sitcom. This is yeah. a 1984, like, movie, and it was supposed to be played straight. And it was just like, hmm, okay. <laughs> you had sledgehammers, so fine. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Um, wrapping up the movie. <sighs> good um, music. Yeah. Good, really good music. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, um, they... But the, before that, the, yeah, the characters end up, you know, closing all their ties and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And it's it's the and rock and roll fable is a pretty good way to describe it because yeah. it does end kind of like a fable. There's no yeah. real good ending. Yeah. And and if done like a good fable, it looks like it's gonna continue, but obviously not. I mean, that movie came out in 1984. Right. It's 2014 now. No and sequel to it. I'm assuming. Uh, I heard a lot that some independent guys were trying to get a sequel together. Yeah, but no sequel yet. Yeah, Ever. but they got they got the actors. They got the actors for it. Like you know, they got Diane Lane. I heard. Really? They got Michael Pyre, and he said he was interested in it. Wait, uh, is this something from way back when, or is this something like uh, this now is, that they're talking about? Oh uh, no, this was like a year ago, I think. Maybe two years oh, ago. Really? Wow. This was a couple of years back. All, and that's all I know. Um, I would be really interested in seeing the sequel. Though. Yeah, it was like I would it's love that. thirty years now and. Character change. Where are they now? Yeah, yeah. you know. And uh, who played McCoy again? Uh, Amy Madigan. Amy Madigan. I think they got in touch with her, but I'm I'm not sure about that. Is she doing anything else right now? Uh, well, I know she's done a lot of work. Uh, I don't know about her working on anything right now. No. So, but but yeah, they got they're trying to get know. in contact with all those guys and maybe make a sequel at some point. Wow. Hopefully, they say it's going to be you know like. Independent budget, so it could be from here to 2018 or something. I don't know. Yeah, but yeah, that's pretty cool. That some guys love the movie enough. That yeah, they, that's awesome, man. I hope they do it. That was a yeah. that movie was goofy as shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was very fucking retarded, but it was a lot of fun. It was cliche. Yeah, but you yeah. know, I mean, back yeah. then was it even a cliche? And, <laughs> no, it it really wasn't. It was like this is how you make a movie because yeah. in the 80s that's how everybody made movies. Yeah. It was just no, you're supposed to, uh, yeah. you know, cackle yeah, the bad guy. And you're supposed to, you know, tell the hero exactly what your plan is and yeah. all the stupid shit, you know. Because that's just what happened in the 80s. Yeah, that's it just was all very, yeah, the dialogue was really breezy. Uh, yeah. Everyone was... <laughs> dialogue in this was funny. Yeah. Because everybody was trying to one-line it. I, I was mentioning this to Danny. It was just one liner after another. One person starts <laughs> off with a one liner, and then the person they're talking to comes back with a one liner, yeah. and then they retort again with a one liner. And it's just you have whole <laughs> conversations like that, and it's just like wow, people don't actually talk like this at all, but it's fucking amazing. Not even you know? in the eighties. No, like nobody that. talked like that ever. I mean, uh, it may be in the movies, yeah, but yeah. not in real life. And it was just so funny because it was like, it was deliberate. You know, when you see a one-liner in a movie, it's always the hero, and it's like, it's almost like the the the, the Schwarzenegger way of making puns. You know, in yeah. fucking Predator, chucks the knife in the guy and he says, "Stick around." You know, it's kind of a one-liner. You know, and that's really what it always was. But in this, it's like whole fucking conversations are one-liners. Between and there are two or three yeah. characters. Sometimes there's another character, and it's just like, let's throw in more one-liners. And it's just like, wow, 
Yeah, the guy that the guy that was the director for this really loved that sort of shit. <laughs> so yeah. He, I guess he just fuck it to make these guys cool. Yeah, <laughs> and he did. He made them all cool. Yeah. And uh, and you were telling me before that the uh, that the director the way that he um, the 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 visuals on everything. Um, the the outfits, the motorcycles, the guns, the music, yeah. the, the rock and roll, that was all because that's what the director liked. Yeah, right. He, he put in all this stuff in it because that's what he loved. That's this is like right. the stuff he grew up with. Like right. he thought it was cool shit and whatnot. And right. Leather suits, you know, the whole like uh, Tom Cody himself was more like a cowboy. Yeah, like, yeah. In a lot and of respects and and to illustrate that point. The two weapons that he has, one which right. he never uses, yeah. <laughs> but the two weapons that he has is one is a cowboy repeater rifle, which he uses every single scene yeah, he can get. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he blows up like nine of the fucking he uses that motorcycle as a freaking bludgeon. Yeah, he uses it constantly. And then he's also got a um, uh, an old Magnum, yeah, um, a six shooter. So you know, it's basically like he's he's, he's kind of like a he's got man. the duster. He's, and he wears a duster. Yeah, yeah. he's got yeah. the duster, and it's he it looks he looked good. He looked good in it. Yeah, yeah, it was really good. He looked good. Uh, he kicked a lot of ass. Uh, he made Willem Dafoe wear oh, yeah. leather overalls. I'm just throwing that out there because yeah. when I saw that, he even heard. I mean, when I saw it, I said, "What the fuck is he wearing?" <laughs> it was leather overalls. They were overalls like you would wear. I don't know if you're a farmer or something like that. Yeah. And he's wearing nothing else, maybe, well, boots, but no shirt. But they're completely leather, yeah. like PVC-style fetish wear leather. That was it? Yeah, that's <laughs> what he was wearing. That was his outfit. I mean, I don't think, he wasn't wearing that the whole movie, yeah. but he was wearing that in one very, like, one yeah, that was, pretty yeah, lengthy well, part. Yeah. And it was just like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> well, okay. Um, all in all, uh, I'm giving it two thumbs up because I like that movie. It was stupid, it was goofy, it was cliched, and it was fantastic. It was 1980s style movie making at its best. That's what they did in the 80s. I know I was there, so that's yeah. that's the way you know. I that's the type of movie that I grew up with. Um, yeah, I was surprised that you. Yeah, well, I was seven. six when this movie came Where out. Were you? So, yeah. yeah. This is 84. I forget how old you are. I'm old. But I was six when this came out. Um, so, yeah, I wasn't going to see it when I was six because I didn't give a shit about that. It was like G.I. Joe and fucking He-Man and Transformers. That's all I, yeah. that's all I care about, you know. Um, it's Star Wars. Um, but, yeah, uh, to me, the movie, it was great. All of the things that... Um, anything that I would like make uh, anything that I would point out to be like a flaw in it isn't actually a flaw it was a it's, product of the time really. yeah it, it was like it was done intentionally um, the dialogue yeah. was done intentionally and it was done well to the point where you know normally like if I'm listening to two people in a movie or whatever try to yeah. talk like that I'm just like click yeah, enough. Like, but with this, it was like, okay, I'm just rolling with this. Yeah, exactly. Because, yeah. because the setting's already set, and it, it does a good job of that. It just, yeah. Just tells you, hey, these are this is the world we live in here. It's like, all right. Yeah. And you, after a while, your just brain just shuts off, and yeah, you'll giggle a little bit now and then because it's like he said, Luke. Yeah. <laughs> I was I was expecting someone to go Palooka. I mean, yeah. Yeah. No, you know, surprised yeah. nobody said it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, juvenile delinquents. Yeah. Um, anyways, uh, last thoughts on the movie? I mean, I gave mine. So. Yeah, I love that movie, man. Yeah, it's my it's my favorite movie. Kick ass soundtrack. I love, yeah, love every piece of music in there. Yeah, especially the ones that they did for the movie, which is like for Fire Inc. I think is what they call them. Yeah, tonight is what it means to be young, and uh, damn, I already forgot the other one. Shit. Yeah, I love well, there, was, so there was that one sn there was that one song that was like called uh, "Pet His Wild Snake" or some shit like that. Uh, yeah, that <laughs> it was, was just uh, like yeah. I think that's the one nice. that played while they were uh, in the bar. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, 
That was an interesting. It sounds song. like that would be it. Um, I think that was the second song that they were singing. Yeah. And that was. <laughs> it was. It was seriously it was something like "Pet His Wild Snake" or "Ride His Wild Snake" or yeah. some shit like that. Hold your. Like, I think it was "Hold Your Snake." Hold your. Yeah. Hold, like your hold, your, hold your wild snake or something. Like that. It's just like. <laughs> yeah, in the eighties, I guess you couldn't get away with just saying "Hold his dick." So. Mm-hmm. Gotta go with snake. Anyway, uh, I think we can wrap it up here. Yeah. It was a uh, all in all. I recommend the movie. I recommend it. You can find it on, uh, you know, YouTube. Like, yeah. Uh, the Google, Google Play, I think it's called. Right. Uh, you can yeah. rent it or you can buy it. Yeah. Me, I bought it because. Yeah. Fuck yeah. He bought it. You bought it on the Google Play. Was it Google Play or is it Yeah, it's Google Play. You bought it for like twelve ninety nine. Yeah, twelve ninety nine. It's so. I got it on Amazon though. Uh, I I haven't gotten it yet, but I ordered a DVD, so um, mine will be coming soon. Um, cheaper than that. Cheaper. But so. yeah, I I I, went, I I just got it because fuck it, man. Yeah, <laughs> gotta have a digital copy somewhere. Yeah, and fuck, fuck it. I love it. <laughs> well, there we go. He loves it, and I thought it was really damn good. It was a lot of fun. So that's uh that's our feeling on Streets of Fire, nineteen eighty four. We're out of here. Yeah.